Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for the very, very last guest session ever for these cohorts, uh, for the JavaScript and for the web development boot camps. If you're just joining us from, uh, ooh, I guess, from the internet, uh, we've been running free web development and free JavaScript boot camps over the last six weeks. We're just ending them now, but you haven't missed out. Myself and my much smarter, much nicer colleague Ramon are going to go and do some planning. I bet we're bet money we're going to plan some more cohorts. But much more importantly, Lola, welcome and thank you so much. <laughs> I, I swear I didn't wait until you were taking a drink. Because um, whenever I'm talking to somebody in the UK and I want to compliment them, I always like to do it to their face because y'all just can't handle it. Lola is working for Samsung uh, and doing quite a bit, a lot of work with W3C um, and is one of the smartest, one of the most interesting people I know. Uh, it would be terrifying how smart and cool she was if she wasn't all, also incredibly gracious about it. Lola, shall I go ahead and get out of your way so you could talk to us about what web standards even are? Hi. Yeah, sure. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um so a little bit about me first before I get into web standards, what they are, what they do, all of that jazz. Um, my name is Lola Dolala and I am a web developer advocate at the moment. Um, what that means is, well, it means different things depending on what company you work for. But in the role I am with Samsung, what that means is a lot of um, web advocacy specifically for the web. So other places may want advocacy for a product or a service, what we are advocating for, for majority of the time, is the web. Um, keeping it public, keeping it open, keeping it accessible, that kind of stuff. So a lot of the work I do, blog posts I write, code I contribute to, um, any kind of like extra stuff such as W3C or more recently uh, open web docs, um, is all about making sure the web is free, open and accessible. And so that's kind of what I do now. I've done a whole bunch of stuff before now. Um, and so feel free to, you know, hit me up on social media to get me to tell you more about that. But I also did a boot camp. So a few years ago, like six, seven, eight years ago now, um, I did a boot camp and it was a Ruby based boot camp. So I learned how to do uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, but mainly Ruby and Ruby on Rails, which are Ruby's a language, a programming language, and Ruby on Rails is a framework. And so that's kind of how I got into tech. My first degree is in English literature and creative writing. Um, and I recently completed my second degree. I finished my second degree last year, and that is in computer science. So I have a variety of experience, a range of experience, and it's not solely just tech. I spent some time teaching English in the secondary school. Um, I've done all sorts of stuff. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about web standards. And so I just want to like encourage folks to ask questions. Feel free to throw questions in there. I'm sure Jess will be able to like field them and, uh, you know, let me know what they are. Feel free to, if anything is confusing, ask for clarification. If I'm going too fast, ask me to slow down. If I'm going too slow, ask me to speed up. Um, I want to make sure that everybody is comfortable with the information I'm sharing and comfortable receiving it. So um, yeah, like sometimes this stuff can get a little bit much and intimidating and I kind of want to dispel that. Standards shouldn't be intimidating. Um, so the one thing that's kind of annoying about uh, this kind of like digital uh, thing is that I can't get your like reaction to stuff. So I could easily ask who knows or who's heard of web standard, but I'm not going to get a realistic depiction of you know, so I'm going to assume everybody's at the base level. I'm going to assume nobody knows anything and we're going to start from there. OK, cool. Jess has said we can keep questions to the end. So if you have any questions, write them down. And at the end of the session, feel free to ask and I will try and answer them. So starting with what is a web standard? Um, 
when you're dealing with technology, you are going to have different types of standards. Um, when you're dealing with the internet, you're also going to have different types of standards. Um, and I want to make a distinction here between the internet, which is kind of like the network in which information and data is sent via, um, and the web, which is one of the ways that we can display information, display data. So you have different kind of things that link to the internet. So the web links to the internet. Mobile applications also link to the internet, but are not necessarily part of the web. Um, we now have smart devices, smart lights, smart fridges, smart everything, which also connects to the internet, but are not the web. So the web is a specific um, entity in and of itself. And it's a way that we um, share information through links. So for I think like a great example is um, Wikipedia, if you go on any Wikipedia page, there will usually be some information and then there'll be a link to a reference somewhere else on the web. And then on that page, there may be a link to somewhere else. We've all seen um, web pages with links in them and that's kind of how the web is interconnected and that's part of what makes it unique, right? And so when we talk about web standards, the standardization process is really about saying how this uh, infrastructure should work. So a good example is um, HTML standard, right? We know that HTML is a programming language that operates in the browser um, and is a way of you know, showing information to users or whatever. And every tag, every HTML tag has a set of rules about how it should be used. And those rules are encompassed in the standard. It says how it should be used, how it shouldn't be used. Um, so for example, with the P tag, it may say that this is a paragraph tag, and these are the ways you should use paragraph tags in a HTML document. These are the ways you shouldn't use a paragraph tag in a HTML document. This is what you should do if you want a different kind of uh, Thing. So you probably don't want to put links in paragraph tags unless these specific use cases, right? So the standard is a way of describing how different web technologies should be used and implemented in the web browser. When you're reading a standard, it can be very intimidating. It can be very confusing because standards aren't written for everybody to understand. Um, standards aren't written for your everyday user and even not necessarily for developers standards are written for uh, browser vendors so people who build browsers who create browsers people who work within the browser ecosystem because the browser is the primary way that we display content on the web right and so it's a they're usually very technical documents um, and to some extent quite scientific. Um, and so they can be very, very confusing, which puts off a lot of people. The W3C is the body that kind of has, I don't wanna say authority because uh, it's, it's not like a cabal, it's not like, but well, it's trying not to be. Um, it's more of a kind of, it's, it's a body, right? Of people who, work on these standards, who decide these standards together, um, and then who implement them and release them so that developers, browser vendors, whoever can interpret the standards and use them to the best of their abilities. Now, the way the W3C works is that there are, I think about 65 or so paid employees. And when I say paid, I mean, they are paid from the host organizations of the W3C. So the W3C works with host organizations all over the world, in Asia, in the US, in Europe. I'm not sure if they, I think there might be one in Africa, but I'm not sure. Um, and those host organizations, usually universities. Um, so in the US is MIT. Um, in Europe, it's a French university, which I can't pronounce. I'm not even gonna try and butcher it. But those host organizations employ people to work on the W3C. And from my understanding, I believe there's about 63 or so. And those people are kind of like, do the like managerial stuff of the W3C. Then you have working groups. And a working group is where a standard kind of comes to life. Um, so you might have an idea for 
a new HTML tag, right? Let's say you want to have a post-it tag, right? I don't know what this post-it tag would do. Maybe, you know, display short snippets of information somewhere on your web page, right? And you have done the research, you have, you know, gathered some feedback from the community and this post-it tag is, has momentum. People want this post-it tag. You might take it to the HTML working group and say, hey, we want to write, this is our spec proposal, the proposal for the uh, standard that we want to um, create. So this is the proposal for the post-it tag. And um, then you would go through the process within the working group to iron things out, edit the proposal and all of this. And it remains a proposal until there's like a consensus um, through various different, it has to go through uh, a few different kind of uh, groups to make sure it, it meets the requirements like ethical and technical requirements of releasing something on the web, and then it becomes um, a standard. And then people can use this proposal, um, this post-it tag if they choose to, right? Um, and so the working group is basically the, the, the kind of start, I'll say it's the start of the process all the way to the end of the process of creating a standard, right? Now, the reason why I said kind of start is because there's another kind of group, the community group, where is more community input. So something I would say about the working group, if I just backtrack for a minute, is that a working group, the people who are involved in a working group have paid to be involved in the working group. And the way that happens is you have member organizations um, and they pay W3C to have input into how standards are created and crafted and all of that. So for example, my employer Samsung is a paying member of the W3C. There is no set price because the how much you pay depends on the size of the company, depends on, you know, a lot of different moving parts. So what Samsung pays is not gonna be what like a startup pays, for instance, right? And so getting into a working group, you have to be part of a member organization. There are very rarely individuals who come into working groups unless they're invited, and that's something completely different. So if you're part of a member body that has paid to be part of the W3C, um, you can be in a working group. If you haven't done that, and you're just a regular, regular person, you can be in a community group. Anyone can join a community group. Community groups are free to join and they encourage people to join because they are sometimes where standards are kind of felt out, where proposals are, are felt out, you know. So a good example, and I gave this example the last time I spoke with um, Jessica's last cohort, is the first party sets proposal by Google. We don't need to worry about what it does or what it is or whatever, but it's a, it's a proposal that Google have and they wanna get an idea of how developers feel about this proposal and also how people in the industry feel about this proposal. It relates to ads, advertising. So there are people who work in advertising um, who they wanna kind of see how they feel about this pro proposal. There are people who work in arts or, you know, just all sorts of different industries that this proposal might affect. And they are welcome to join the community group, ask as many questions as they want and really interrogate the proposal that Google is putting forth, right? And because it's free to join, um, you end up having a diverse pool of input. And that means that when the proposal kind of go, well, the idea is that the proposal will go through a rigorous process of like, you know, I don't want to say bashing, but kind of like bashing, like, you know, you want to ask the hard questions so that by the time it gets to a working group, you've already kind of gone through the difficult bits. Um, and those are the kind of like two main kind of groups. There are other kinds of groups though. So you have business groups and interest groups, which are slightly different, um, slightly a bit more managerial. Um, and then you have the technical architecture group, which is kind of like the, uh, they're the like, they're the dons, they're the like people who decide, or not, I don't wanna say decide, but they kind of, 
yeah, they decide that something doesn't quite meet the uh, doesn't quite meet the rec requirements of something being a, a, a standard, or they decide that it does meet the requirements of being a standard. And there are requirements, there are technical as, and ethical requirements, as I mentioned before, that you have to meet before something can become a standard and before something can, you know be released out into the world to use. So sometimes what happens is if a proposal is in a community group that has been, you know, heavily um, heavily criticized and, you know, I don't want to say criticized, that's the wrong word, but like, you know, going through that process of question asking and interrogation, um, if a standard is in, the, if a proposal is in that process, they might also pitch it to the technical architecture group so that they can receive input from them too and see is this something are there holes in this where can we you know fix the holes how can we make this better and all of that and the technical architecture group will give feedback the technical architecture group is a works on a nomination basis so everybody who's in the technical architecture group has been nominated to be in the technical architecture group you can't just being in right um and so it's a very small group of people compared to other groups in the um in the w3c it's, it's very small and it's um it's made up of people from different corners of the internet so i believe at the moment you've got somebody from mozilla on there you've got someone from samsung on there um and i believe you've got an independent person on there so it's not just it's, it's made up of people who know what they're talking about when it comes to the web so they have a wealth of experience a large body of work behind them to kind of say yes we know what we're talking about when it comes to the web and so the technical architecture group interrogates the proposal on a more rigorous basis, according to some requirements. And the requirements are public. Everybody knows what the requirements are or should do. Everybody who's writing a proposal, that is. And then when it's gone through the community group process, um, it's redirected to the appropriate working group. And then in the working group process, you will edit the proposal and you will continue discussing and writing and fine tuning things until it's then released to the public. So that's kind of like the journey of a standard. Um, and as I mentioned, these standards, W3C in particular deals with web standards. So anything pertaining to CSS, JavaScript and HTML will have a standard, um, a web standard with it, right? Now, last time somebody asked, why is it just those three? And that's because those three languages deal with the browser directly, right? So you wouldn't have a Python web standard because Python is not really a web programming language. Python is a programming language, but you can have a Python server that is not sat on the web, that doesn't interact with the web at all. You know, you can have a Java a server or Ruby server in exactly the same space. We talk about web standards, we talk about programming languages that deal specifically with the web. If there was a new programming language that came out tomorrow that was like, I don't know, uh, candle script, I say that because I'm burning a candle literally right now, but let's say candle script came out tomorrow and you could only use this programming language in the web, then yes, we would include candle script in the languages that have uh, W3C web standards with them. So yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, if you want to know uh, how you can get involved in community groups, I'm going to paste a link in the chat and hopefully Jessica will be able to share it. Um, but this is the link w3c.org slash community slash groups and you can go through all the groups that are there and as I mentioned they're free to join. Now it can be intimidating when you're joining a community group or when you're joining any kind of group you may feel like you have to be technically minded or you may feel like you have to like understand like really in-depth technical things and that's just not the case. Um, I am part of the privacy community group and there's a lot of stuff that I, in fact, the last meeting we had, most of that went over my head, um, partly because there were no diagrams to explain the thing. But 
because it's a community group, and I mean, with most groups, you can do this even with working groups, you can ask questions. Even if the question seems silly to you, um, you don't know who's who else you know, has the same question. You can ask questions, you can interrogate things, you can ask things to be repeated or explained in a different way. Um, the last privacy C, uh, community group meeting I had, I asked in Slack, like, is there a diagram for this thing that's been explained? And other people also wanted a diagram because other people also didn't quite get it, right? And so, yes, a lot of these conversations are technical, but try not to let that put you off. Um, when I got started, I've only been involved in web standards for the last year and a bit. Um, and when I first got involved, I I hadn't, I was lost. I was just like, what is this? This sounds complicated. This sounds like a lot. Um, and the thing that helped me was kind of just like jumping into the deep end, just like going to meetings, trying to understand the lingo. Thankfully for privacy um, community group and for many groups, they have minutes. So even if you don't follow what's happening live in the meeting, you can read the minutes after at your own pace and Google terms, ask questions in GitHub or Slack or whatever com um, communication tool that uh, your group uses. And that's a good way to slowly get involved and understand. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it in terms of web standards, what they do, what they're for, who can get involved. Um, and I'm ready to take questions now, I guess. Oh, shall I come back and join you for questions? Cool. And I'm going to, oh, oh, no, we've done that the wrong way. That's fine. <laughs> Fabulous. So does anybody have any questions about web standards? Um, you mentioned uh, if it's not cheating, there's a little bit of a delay. So they're going to have much smarter questions than mine. But I always take advantage of the delay. You mentioned that you're on the privacy working group. Um, of course, you've given us the link, which is really useful. What other kinds of focuses? Are they specific focuses like privacy? Or are they mostly grouped around technical aspects? or just um, privacy count the technical aspect so i'm part of the privacy community group community not the working group um and are you asking in terms of like what happens in the privacy community group? so what kinds of things what kinds of topics are the are the community groups generally focused around so a variety of things i will tell you right now that there are 372 community groups oh. so oh, I uh, there was just like a couple and you'd be like oh well, we've got one for this no we're good no <laughs> there, there are a lot so there's like one for accessibility there's one for the immersive web there's one for web machine learning um web id there's one for maps for html if anyone's interested in like mapping um there is you know area and assistive technologies so if anyone is interested specifically when it comes to accessibility specifically in area tags and roles and things like that and also assistive technologies such as screen readers and things like that there's one for that i mean there's there's one for there's publishing um music notation if anyone is a musician or reads music you know there's one for like almost everything and if there isn't one for something you want one for you can create one so you can create one um you'd have to be you'd have to create a w3c account but you can create one um and yeah, there's one for web, improving web advertising. There's anti-fraud. I mean, all those yeah. people deeply passionate about advertising out there. <laughs> other people might be. Other people might be. Uh, we've got a, 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 some really good questions. Zola's giving us one that kind of feels like a softball to be like, are these standards freely accessible? Uh, yes. Um, yes. Where can I find these standards? So it depends on the specific standard you are looking for. Um, I would say uh, a good kind of avenue into standards is to, so the W3C um, has this page. I'm gonna share it here. 
it's w3c.org slash standards um and it you can basically like go through different uh uh standards so like web design and applications for instance then it's got like javascript web apis and then it goes through what the scripting process is and blah 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 um if you want to get involved in a working group um or you want to see a working group standard that's a little bit more tricky because it's not as clear cut it really depends on which standard you I was know say there's 300 something of them is everybody kind of doing their thing in a, in a slightly different way yeah so like there's 372 community groups i'm not even sure how many working groups there are or business groups or whatever so it is kind of like everyone does things in their own way primarily though what you would have is and let me just see if i can find it what you would have is the um a github page right so you might um we have w3c has a github called uh, github.com slash w3c um, and you can find a whole lot of repositories and a lot of these repositories are public and also host the um, the standards that are being worked on for that repository. So, for example, um, the, repos the group I'm part of the Privacy CG, I've literally just lost it, the Privacy CG has a repository where it's like has all the um, uh, standards we are discussing at the moment, as well as minutes, as well as um, agendas and um, meeting information, right? So I'm going to put that. Because yeah. this kind of answers the very next question to be like, hey, do y'all have like a wiki or a dictionary? For Yeah, it sounds like they all, they all sort of live on GitHub with some documentation around them. Yeah, and they do live on the web. So I'm not sure that there is a one place for everything. Um, and I really should have like tried to find that actually. I'm not sure that there is a one place for everything because so like I'm going to share this page. This is an example of what a standard could look like. This is not a standard. This is a web platform design principles, but a standard pretty much looks like this, right? Would it be um, okay for me to throw this up on the screen and have us take a look at it together? Would that be a bother? Um, let me, no, let me just move this to a compatible browser and we mm. can do that. Wow, it's almost like different browsers being able to handle different <laughs> things. Right. Well, or badly is both the responsibility of individual developers to test across different browsers, but mm -hmm. also the responsibility of browser, and browser vendors is a very industry way to say, those nerds who make the browsers, like the nerds yeah. the browsers should probably be keeping them pretty tightly aligned as well. Yeah, nerds yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Super chill. And the reason uh, for, for our learners, the re it sounds a bit like an inside joke, and I always hate that. Lola and I had been sort of chuckling when we came on because I had, had to say, oh, well, you know, the software we're using to stream actually works best in a specific browser. And that's not what you want to tell somebody on, on, on a W3C uh, talk, is it? Be like, hey, thanks for helping make yeah. the web standardized. By the way, it's going to work better if you use this one specific browser, which which really shouldn't happen. Exactly. Um, my, sorry, my uh, my Mac is too secure. Everything is fine. Computers were a mistake. <laughs> if you like, uh, I can race you to it. Just because. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you just use that um, yeah. that last link. Oh, this is, shall I go ahead and make this a bit bigger? I've got old lady eyes. Say when. Sure. One more? Keep oh, going. Oh, one less. One yeah. More. Yeah, so that's fine. So this is an example of what a web standard could look like, right? So you have the version, the published, the latest published version, 
the editor's draft, history, and where you can give feedback, who the editor is and what company they work for. That's particularly important because you want to know um, what organization is kind of funding this work. So the editor who's done this has been paid essentially by Google to be involved in this. Um, and then you have former editors and then you've got who like who this is by and that's members of the tag um, and ways you can participate, which is in this case, a GitHub link. Um, Would, do, well, sure. You know, I hate to, to click on things live that I haven't vetted, but we think the GitHub link for this will probably be yeah, we, we, I, yeah, I think it's sound because this is the 16th of December last year. So <laughs> you were like sound. somebody, you're so patient. The learners have had me like lots of times be like, look at this link on the internet and we won't click it because and it doesn't. We're, <laughs> <laughs> like, but we, we've looked at some GitHub projects in the past and this is really interesting because it's really a GitHub project for the standard. Yeah, exactly. So th these issues are people saying, hey, 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 hey. I saw this standard and I have an opinion or this will break or this doesn't work. Right. This exactly. An issue in the most fundamental. I am taking an issue with this sense. Exactly. Or I have a question or I would like to fix this. Am I allowed? This is a, it, the way that uh, GitHub issues work in the standards process is slightly different to the way they work when you're building an application. So I used to be a software engineer for a few years before I transitioned into developer advocacy. And often how we would use GitHub issues is we would, I mean, let's say there's a bug in the code, we would file an issue with a link to the bug, and then we would attach that issue to a fix, a pull request that fixes that issue. And that was kind of the flow. With standards, it's like you said, Jess, it's a lot more about conversation in a way, right? And actually a better example would be uh, the privacy CG. So I'm just gonna share yeah. that link with you, Jess, if, if you don't mind, because I think that would so have more interesting- With me being oh, a no. fast driving. <laughs> No, 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 it's okay. So actually I have one open right now. So I want to just kind of specify that this, we don't need to get into the weeds about what this standard proposal is or is about. I just want to show you an example of the issues. So that's the link, Jess. Oh, this makes me me kind of think we're going to see some internet argument. Ooh. Oh, they, they don't no, like this is, no, I, oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> My life is so this boring is, these days where I'm just like, is it going to be standards drama? Oh, there's no is it going to be here. drama? <laughs> this isn't the dramatic one. Um, I chose Ooh. not to share the dramatic one for uh, everybody's sake. But basically, um, this is a new API that's been discussed. Now, as you can see, this isn't on a W3C page, right? So the person who owns this GitHub repo is just has it on theirs, right? But that's because this isn't part of, this hasn't entered the standards process completely yet. It's still entering in it. It's part of the, one of the advertising groups, right? It's, that's where it's being discussed. And in that place, you would see all the standards in that, that is being discussed in that group. I can show another example soon. Yeah. But in that place, you would see all the, dis so here, when we look at the issues here, we can see that some of these are questions. What is the performance impact? of this proposal. Oh, wow. That's, right? that's genuinely just a question. So it's like, yeah. hey, what's, what's the performance impact in ter of the system? So of, of this thing that we're, we're proposing, we might propose that we're proposing. Cool. Is wait, I'm absolutely going to make things worse by asking it like this. Go ahead. Is this at the stage where they're proposing it to the W3C? We want to do this thing. Or are they proposing it to the working group that we may want to propose this to the W3C? So this is the thing where they're actually proposing to the community oh. and saying, oh. we want to do this thing. Um, and then if the community is like, we want you to do this thing, then they will take the proposal to the working group and say, hey, we and the community want to do this thing. 
So really, if you're annoyed by, well, I mean, there's so many things to be annoyed by in 2022, <laughs> aren't there? Um, if you're annoyed by something in web standards, finding the appropriate GitHub pages for where these decisions are being made mm -hmm. and being ready to jump and say, hey, what if we do this thing differently next time for important technical reasons? Exactly. And something I should have mentioned before that I don't know why this gets to my mind because it's literally integral to my job. I am the co-founder of the W3C Developer Council. What that means is um, we want to kind of bridge the gap between the developer community, not just the developer community, but anybody who creates on the web, anybody who uses the web, anybody who's interested in the web and the W3C. So that's students like yourselves, um, that's people like Jess, people like me, that's people who use web, the web for advocacy, for activism, for art, for whatever, and uh, introduce them into web standards. So if you are looking for a particular web standard and you don't know where to go, you can actually just ask us. Um, you can submit an issue and I will actually share the link for this again. Um, uh, I love how you said people like Jess. You do not want me involved in standards. I joked about <laughs> bringing back Blink earlier, so other people are joking about this. I confess that I asked that in a in a in a in a company meeting where they were like, "Yeah, any questions?" Uh, for a meeting that was on the W three C board to be like, "Can we can we put that back in our browser?" No. <laughs> um, so, I so this link I've is been embarrassing in multiple places in multiple ways, not just. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this link is the where you can submit issues um, for the Dev Council. So like if you wanted to know, there's nothing, well, not that there's nothing, but the things that are there are really pertaining to our agenda meetings. Um, we're still in the process of getting started. We want to finalize our working statement so people know what to expect from us and how to interact with us. But you can submit um, issues here that are kind of like, hey, I'm interested in AR and XR technology, is there a working group or community group that deals with web XR, web AR? And I can, or someone on the team can be like, hey, yeah, actually, here is the link. Here's how you join. This is what you do. Um, and I'm so- I'm the worst very briefly. What's an AR? What's an XR? Yeah, so AR stands for augmented reality. Um, and XR stands for, let me just, uh, oh, Google this. I was going to say, like, I don't remember what XR. So AR, I think I, I'm going to pretend I know that because you just said it out loud. Um, I, th I think it stands for mixed reality. That makes sense. Sorry, no, extended reality. So AR is augmented reality. XR is extended reality. I don't know the difference between the two. I thought you were just going to be like, and of course I know the difference in a really casual way because I, I, I do not for love Norman. We'll say augmented no. is stuff added, whereas extended is stuff Stuff ex added. extended. <laughs> <laughs> extended reality is when they just make reality a longer. There we are. That's the official, uh... very technical explanation. We had Patty asking a second ago saying, Okay, so can you elaborate a little bit more about why the W3C wouldn't have, uh, like, wouldn't extend for something like Python? So just sort of, I think here what might be really useful is just to, to look again at the definition of what a web technology is. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's kind of like the important thing when we talk about the web, right? And so the web... Everything on the web is just a file. It's literally just a document. Um, so HTML, well, okay, let me backtrack. Not everything on the web, a lot of the web works by documents. So you have files, HTML files, which read CSS and JavaScript files. And within the HTML file, you have a link, a hyperlink that links to another HTML file somewhere else on the web. And that page will have, that document will have another link that links to another web page. That is something that's unique to web technologies. Hang on, I hate to interrupt. Sorry. Why, I don't hate to interrupt you. Um, otherwise I wouldn't do it. I'm just rude all the time. You're very, <laughs> oh, 
so back in, this is going to prove my age, back in 1990. Oh, no, I'm so old. Oh, no. Never mind about when. Back when the web was new, uh, Tim Berners-Lee wrote a book about why he made it and how he made it. And it is really, really fundamentally coming back to the, it's a series of documents with links just really stripped down because we think, oh, the web's so big and it's so complicated. When we're talking about the core of the web, isn't it just documents with links? Yes, absolutely. It's about linking documents together across the web. Um, and that's kind of what makes it... Sorry, Massey, we just went off. I don't know if anyone heard that. Um, that's what makes it uh, unique in a way. And so... The reason why Python or Ruby or Java is not included in that um, as a, because they are not web technologies. They serve a different purpose. Can they be used on the web? Some may argue yes, but they are not native to the web. Uh, and that's the difference. In order to, so uh, it, I'm going to use my own background here as an example. I don't know too much about Python. I did a little bit of Python for my master's, but uh, but Ruby is my background. And with Ruby, you can build servers. With JavaScript, you can build servers too nowadays, but initially that was not the case. Um, JavaScript was about web interactivity. Um, but with Ruby, you can build servers, you can talk to databases and all of that. You also have a framework called Ruby on Rails. And what Ruby on Rails allows you to do is create web pages, whether in HTML, whether in another programming language, uh, but everything gets synthesized down to HTML. So when you go on a Ruby app that's hosted on the web, you don't see any .rb files. What you will see is .js files, JavaScript, .html files, HTML, .css files, CSS. You're not going to see any files that correlate to Ruby. And you might not know it's a Ruby app unless you know what to look for, kind of telltale signs of something that is built with Ruby on Rails. Similar to Python and Django, when you have a Django app that's hosted on the web, you're not going to see .py files. You're going to see .html, .css, and .javascript files. Everything gets synthesized down to um, HTML, CSS, and, and that, that includes even if you're using a HTML framework, there are HTML frameworks. That includes if you're using a CSS framework, there are CSS frameworks too. I've, so, been, I've not been lying to the learners. Um, but every time somebody is like, what about this framework? I'm like, cool, let's, let's not do that yet. Please, please. Just, just because as a meanie, I like to say, hey, what if we learned CSS first? Uh, definitely learn CSS. Yeah, definite, I like that's the approach to go. Definitely learn CSS and JavaScript first before you go into the JavaScript frameworks and the CSS frameworks as well. It gives you an amazing foundation to understand what's actually happening in those frameworks and how to actually interact with those frameworks. So yeah. I would agree with that. And what a great note to end on agreement. Uh, we put your <laughs> Twitter into the chat. Is there any place else anybody can see what kind of stuff you're working on or say hello? Uh, Twitter is the best place for now, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, oh, God. Oh, just a quick one. We've got a really good question. And I'm excited for this. Sure. It's like, oh, two questions. One from me. Wouldn't you agree that people who have a, you, you, you know exactly what this that is. That's not leading at all. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Um, well, don't you think that an English language or, or really any kind of a literature background is a fantastic background for going into tech? <laughs> not to be biased, <laughs> uh, but yes. Um, I, yes. I have a similar background as well. So I'm just like, to be biased. Yes, yes, yes. And I've got somebody here saying, Ada saying, oh, I have a background in English literature. What do we think are the advantages and the disadvantages of having humanities as your background and what value can it provide? Who doesn't love a general question? Yeah, so for me personally, uh, English actually helps me to learn how to code in the sense that um, learning English, so I did English literature and a large part of my degree was about 
getting meaning from words that may not necessarily be explicit in what they mean. Um, and so you have to you have to learn how to decode language, understand grammar, understand the purpose of grammar, why certain grammatical things make sense in one context, why they don't in another. When I was learning Ruby, that helped me because I began to think of Ruby as literally a lang like a language with grammar rules, with sentence structure rules, with all of this stuff. If I do not put a comma in my list of arrays, then my computer does not know how to process that. And that's not because I understood programming. No, it's because I understood in English, when you write a list in general, you use commas to delineate between each item in the list. So it was kind of, it, it didn't, it wasn't easy, coding it wasn't easy for me, but that foundation definitely helped make it easier for me when I was learning and trying to understand. And it also gives you a wider skill set. A lot of technical people don't know how to write or relate to people who are not technical. And that's just facts. Um, and when you have a background that deals with communication, that deals with knowing how to speak, knowing how to talk um, and telling stories, you can definitely transcribe that to um, coding and also um, writing technical documentation, whether it's blog posts or whatever. We've got one, one last question and then I promise sure. I, I want to be respectful of your time. I know how terrible it is. Oh no, that's okay. Patricia, who's just always a joy, is like, hey, I want to make sure and look at this, Patricia, after my own Aww. work. I want to make sure that my website complies with accessibility according to the W3C. What, what, and I think I know. What, look, look, you're already typing. You're like, I got it. I got it. I got it. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I go to the accessibility principles, what, which, how do I do this? How do I get to understand these deeply? I hope is what this question involves. How can I make sure I'm doing it right? And Patricia follows it up and saying like, look, I'm trying here. And I'm like, you're, you're trying to win my own heart. And you know, there's just a lot of information here. Oh, no, the, ac the accessibility issue wasn't just an example. Obviously, that is the number one example. Here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But like, hypothetically, if I wanted to make a perfectly... You grab in the working group. I'll race you. Yeah. You know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're doing stuff at the W3C. There's no way you're going to find it. You're Like, I'm going to find it before you. Um, I've, I've found some guidelines. Oh gosh, what is the the wagag wagag wagag? Yeah, I never remember the freaking W C A D wagag. I'm gonna paste it. Hey, I found it. Wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, how can you develop a website that complies to accessibility according to W three C? Jess is gonna show you the link now. These are the main principles. Um for accessibility. There are different things you obviously want to consider, stuff with color, stuff with typography, all sorts, all sorts of things you want to consider. But also accessibility, these are the principles, but be aware that not everything is documented here. Um, and that's why user testing with diverse user groups is important. So um, only recently, I think either within the last couple of years or so, did they add anything about motion and like oh. how it may affect people with motion sickness or vertigo and things like that. And I'm not sure if that's even in there if I read that somewhere else. It's but like, the, it's in the, I was going to say it's in the documentation. It's in um, MDN. We saw that uh, on Wednesday was yesterday. Wednesday was yesterday. Wednesday was yesterday. Mm. Uh, we saw that yesterday for the folks who are in the, the web boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, just th this is, I will always say that this is a good start, but this is not necessarily the end. Um, and accessibility is something you're always going to have to reiterate on. You don't just code it once, build it once and done. You're always going to have to be working on that to improve it. So it should always be a part of your development process and not an afterthought. Um, that was a bit of a run, but this yeah, link God, that, delightful one. Uh, <laughs> that Jess shared is where you will see like the main 
the main things you the should consider. Deal. Yeah. Yeah. Lola, thank you so much for your time. You are always informative and delightful and funny. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, thank you so much. And for all thank of you. you who are in the boot camp, um, we've got a Saturday session that's completely optional if y'all want to drop. But really, the only homework I can give you at this point is the same homework y'all been getting, which is please be as gentle and lovely to yourselves as you can. Like the whole world is hard. I'll let you go and I'll see you Saturday. And then we're not going away forever. Ramon and I will have a think. We'll do some planning. I will come back and do something else. Everything's going to be fine. Bye team.